Hey everybody, welcome to the 130 presentation on greenhouses. How far have we come? Please silence your cell phones if you haven't already all already already. I am Shango Lowe's host of the Shaping Fire podcast. If you like listening to smart interviews with the top minds in cannabis, I invite you to check out the show at shapingfire.com. Um, we also have an extraordinary YouTube channel with over 150 speaker videos I've recorded at events just like this one. Eric's presentation from today will be there next week, and uh, heck, we probably have got four or five videos with Eric at this point talking about different aspects of greenhouses. So make sure you check that out at shapingfire.com, and uh, there are postcards in the back near the door while they last to help you remember the name Shaping Fire. Eric Branstead has been producing cannabis on Northern Calif in Northern California for decades. He is a nationally known greenhouse and light depth expert, speaking nearly everywhere now for almost 15 years. He is, now, he is now founder of Greenhouse Advisory Group, helping commercial cultivators choose placement, build, and even rescue underproducing greenhouses. He's also a really good guy and a reliable friend. So please welcome Eric Branstead. Hey, thank you. I put my phone away. I don't know why I did that. I uh, I run the the uh, keynote, so I gotta have my phone in order to run the presentation. I'm not checking my social medias. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you, Shango, for that nice introduction. It's always good seeing you. And, and uh, a little bit about me. I uh, my family started farming in 1862 in California, not too far from Sacramento, and so they weren't into cannabis and. Uh, when I was 18 years old, I left to go to Humboldt County and, and kind of follow my way in, 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 in the cannabis, I guess you could say. And so um, I started learning a lot of that right away, a lot about cannabis right away. Um, at that time, for light deprivation, it was called black boxing at the time. People would take cardboard boxes and individually uh, black box each plant in order to create this photo period. The old timers in the 60s, late 60s going into the 70s used to black box all their small seedlings in order to get them to sex. Um, and so people have been black boxing for photo period for one reason or another um, since the early 70s from a lot of my research. Um, I really got into the greenhouse side of things for light deprivation um, greenhouses in, in uh, 2006. Um, and so basically we, I was with a company called Forever Flowering Greenhouses and we pioneered the light deprivation technique. We didn't necessarily invent it, but we kind of made it available to the public and also spent a lot of time doing research and development on how to best uh, work these things. And so my presentation today isn't so much on the technological side of how to grow in the greenhouses because I've done that a lot and I'm basically kind of going to go over where we, where we were, how we got there, where we've come, how far we're going, those kind of things. Um, it's a little bit of a history lesson too to kind of see why the things we did are um, in place even today. Um, one of the reasons people went into greenhouses primarily because prohibition was starting to lighten up, especially in California, and so with our quasi-legal 215, um, greenhouses, especially up in Northern California, were quite popular, you know, mainly because of the weather. Um, a lot of times the weather was the main concern for needing a greenhouse, and it wasn't even used as a greenhouse. Most people would put the skin on, take the skin off. If it rained, put it on. If it doesn't, it's a nice day, leave it off type of thing. Um, it wasn't until later on where we really started refining these light deprivation techniques and realizing that we can use the greenhouse more year round. And it really does make a lot of sense though because greenhouses were invented for winter time. Um, most people in cannabis and hemp are all in for the summer and so it's kind of an opposite way of looking at things sometimes when you have these contraptions that were intended for different seasons but these typical grow you know, these type of growers only want to use them when they're not necessarily intended for. So of course they have a lot of stumbling blocks and um, I like to say hostility that comes along with it just because a lot of people go, well, the greenhouses get too hot. Um, you know, and so the first thing that, you know, people say they come from an indoor background is we need a cooling system. But, you know, we're not all in Pueblo, Colorado where it's really hot and really dry or really dry even for that matter, regardless of the heat. Um, California and the West Coast is full of places that are um, high humidity, you know, in the Emerald Triangle on a 90 degree day can have 40% relative humidity already and so the traditional cooling systems and wet walls of greenhouses don't always work like they do um, in some of these drier places. And so back in the day we kind of had to start out from this, you know, 
you know, brass root style, I guess you could say, because we are also off the grid. Even today in California, there's a lot of licensed farms that are off the grid and they don't have electricity. And so they still use uh, these type of greenhouses right here. And so the hoop house was really the original or the first type of greenhouse that was used for pulling tarps, to actually pull the tarp over to create this photo period. Um, and so we didn't really, you know, start out with automated everything. Um, and also with automated requires electricity. So again, we had to really look at things from a basic standpoint. And so the hoop houses, um, you know, these ones have some beds in them, but there were also containers. 30 gallon road bags were the most popular container for the majority of time, I guess you would say. You can grow a pretty big plant in a 30 gallon grow bag, and we would move it in and move it out the same day. And the 30 gallon grow bags would be on a pallet so that we could move them in and move them out without actually having to carry them. We could call a rental company and rent a tractor or a bobcat for the day. We didn't have to buy a piece of equipment. We just rent it, have it there, pull the plants out, move the new plants in. And most of the time with the new plants, we had four or five foot tall trees ready to go inside. So they were able to be flowering the same day as we moved out. Um, that model changed a little bit because of people trying to recycle their soils. The number one thing, everybody used to throw their soil away, get new soil containers, you know, this kind of thing. When we get into the beds, people are saving their soil. They're not throwing the soil out every time. And so, you know, a lot of the growing techniques have changed over the times. But one of the main reasons was also the plant counts. In California, we were subjugated to plant counts. So some counties and places before we went Prop 64 recreational, we had some counties that did have um, some wannabe ordinances that says, okay, you can grow 25 plants, you can grow 60 plants, you can grow 12 plants in these various counties. And so of course you wanted to grow the biggest plant possible. And that's why they grew in 30 gallon grow bags on a pallet to be able to move in and move out right away. Now, we have no limited, unlimited plant counts. We're still within a square footage, but you can grow as many plants as you want in that space. And so it's a lot more popular these days for people to be growing really small plants. Um, the hoop houses, um, like I said, had different forms over the course of time. And one of those was the, the start of the plywood end walls. And you can see a lot of today's light depth greenhouses have solid end walls because they're keeping the light out. Um, where the blackout system is because on the end walls where there's fans and doors it's really hard to automate a curtain right there. We have all these different squares and openings and things and so it was much easier just to make the end wall solid but that came with problems too along the way and so the first hoop house that we did um, you know we thought the plywood would be great we used the light traps over the fans you can see in that picture the two square the two squares um, are the light traps that would keep the light from going through, but we're able to still use the exhaust fans and intakes. Years before that, we didn't do anything. We didn't have light traps all the time, so we really had to know um, when to pull our tarps and the weather around that sometimes. It wasn't always as easy as it is now as far as breathability. Um, and so nonetheless, what happened was is this greenhouse still had a hot pocket from the roll-up sidewalls up is a dead zone, and so it doesn't matter if you open the doors, turn on the fans, um, when you turn on the fans, you actually don't get one air exchange per minute because you've broken the seal of negative pressure by rolling up the side or opening the door. The fan pulls from the closest point of no resistance. So we saw right away a lot of people running the hoop houses wrong because they constantly have the sides up with these big, uh, you know, electricity consuming fans running and they still were struggling with the heat. Um, and so basically what we did for this greenhouse at the time, because we didn't really know exactly what to do, uh, was right up here in this zone, uh, we cut it out with a sawzall and made what we called a trap flap. Um, and we, by opening both ends up at the top right there, we didn't have air traps so that it would heat up. Because again, greenhouses trap air, the air that's trapped heats up, and that air has to go somewhere. And if the fans don't get rid of it, we have to avoid it naturally. And so by not trapping air, it didn't heat up. And so that was the number one goal, was to avoid the greenhouse effect in the summertime. Um, and so we did that with the plywood end walls, and then it went a little further. Um, the next 2.0 um, wasn't this one, actually. But that's a nice little picture. Was this one. Uh, the doors go from the ground all the way to the ceiling. And so by having the doors go from the ground to the ceiling, we now have the door and we have the vent at the same time. And so a lot of people with the hoop houses go with the passive ventilation because of being off the grid or limited amount of power. Or if you're in California, you don't just get power all the time anymore. They shut it off. 
So basically, having the sides rolled up and having both ends open from the top to the bottom took away the greenhouse effect. We avoided the solar gain, which was the important part of the greenhouse growing in the summertime. We didn't need it to be a greenhouse. We didn't walk outside on a 100 degree day going, we need it to be 130. Um, that just isn't the case. And so avoiding the solar gain in the greenhouse was crucial. Um, and then the next step was having the greenhouse cover do the work for us. Um, as we get through the hoop houses, we'll see some cool, you know, here's some artwork. People started adding some artwork to their greenhouses. Um, anybody guess what strain that was reflecting? Purple punch, right? See the cookie over there knocked out, the banana over there. But purple punch didn't end up being as punchy as we hoped. <laughs> uh, this is um, California. Um, this is a 40-acre uh, hoop house farm. So I mean, people do scale up with hoops. A lot of people go, "Well, hoops are for little, you know, basic cottage or whatever." Um, there are these are considered berry hoops, but they're already existing in Santa Barbara County. But you can see it's tough to see. They're full of cannabis, and so that's 40 acres of cannabis growing in hoop houses. Um, and so there is some scalability to it, but again, um, it does require a lot more labor. Um, when we talk about the light depth technique, a lot of people are familiar with it nowadays from the more automated systems, but back in the day when we first started pulling tarps, it was with ropes and standing on ladders and doing some crazy stuff. And so really what they would do is have a piece of a plastic laying on the side of the greenhouse with some ropes attached to that piece of plastic and then some tennis balls at the end of the rope. And so that what they do is stand on one side of the greenhouse, throw the tennis balls over the greenhouse, and then go to the other side and grab the ropes to pull them over. And so this is what uh, that would look like. It's a good time for you to take a drink. This is also what it looks like when it fails. <laughs> Yeah, so that, that facility has 10 of those greenhouses and you can imagine the labor involved in 10 greenhouses on a licensed facility, you know, kind of doing this. And so, you know, over the course of time, we see a lot of people have to cut corners or chew the fat in some cases. And so there's a lot of different ways to chew the fat and this wouldn't be one of them. I see that a lot. I went to a greenhouse facility recently, new construction and a way to save a couple bucks as they didn't get the, the light depth system, you know, and so in a lot of ways, you can get by for a minute, but if you're trying to create flowers throughout the summer, summer, you need the curtain system. And so saving some money right there isn't really making any sense because you're not actually going to be able to get to your goal at the end of the day. So there has been a lack of planning over the course of time, but um, uh, we do run into some things here and there. This is a, a simple hoop house that's up in Humboldt County, but it, what it has is a manual um, depth system on the inside that was rigged up by a handy greenhouse installer. And so along the way we do find resourceful things that actually are kind of the same concept of what we used to use, but really bringing, uh, bringing it into the next level, I guess you could say. And so having a manual interior depth system is really important because of weather. A lot of the manual depth systems are from the outside and the outside comes with a lot of exposure and problems as well. A lot of them aren't as easy to permit in some counties as well. And so um, in California at least, and, and I believe in some other states, but in California we have greenhouse rules and we have what's called hoop house rules. And so there's code and non-code. And so in some counties, for instance, you might be able to build a 20 by 48 under a thousand square foot greenhouse with no electricity and it can be exempt. You don't need a building permit, but it's legal to grow cannabis in. No electricity, so you can't put fans or lights or anything in it. So it's almost like an outdoor grow with a little uh, protection or a little ability to do some light depth or whatever. And so a lot of people look for those, you know, ways around things. So some people will put 14, 10 to 14, you know, under 1,000 square foot hoop houses all over their property to get to their 10,000 square foot license, um, which seems kind of crazy and a lot of work, but, it, you know, it, it is. But at the same time, um, you know, especially in the Emerald Triangle, that's all there was to offer. The next step that we got into were the Gothic frames. I actually was lucky enough to sell one of the first greenhouses in Pueblo, Colorado, um, which was one of these Gothics. Before it really turned into Pueblo back in the day, um, we had sold one of these greenhouses to a, a dispensary. Um, and so 
we were kind of the first on scene for a lot of things in a lot of different places, but um, Pueblo has really turned into, you know, the mega structures now versus a lot of these things. But again, it was many years ago. Um, here's just another side view of the Gothic frame. The Gothic frame is a little bit like I'd like to call mid-tech compared to the lower tech of the hoop house. Um, they can be more engineered to be permitted, and they can also have the interior automated light depth system. They also can be engineered to handle more snow and wind than hoop houses. That's why there's also hoop house rules. One of the guidelines for the hoop house rules is that you take the skin off in the winter time. So if you're in Trinity County or even Humboldt for that matter, they recommend or make it a rule even that you take the skin off so that if it snows, there's no chance of it collapsing or anything like that. But if you want to go grow year round and, and not take the skin off, then you jump to the next bracket of greenhouse, which would be um, possibly the Gothic shape frame. Um, here's, some go here's a Gothic frame that's 144 feet long, so the single structures got to be really popular. Then there's also the gutter connected structures. The gutter connected Gothic frames um, also are kind of the mid-tech of the gutter connectables uh, greenhouses. Um, they typically come in a four and a six foot on center, um, and they can't go everywhere. Uh, they also make good places to give education. We did a lot of greenhouse, we did a lot of classes inside these greenhouses because uh, we didn't grow in one of them. It was a demo greenhouse, and so it actually provided us a great classroom if we did it in the spring and the fall because it would get too hot or too cold to cram everybody in there. Uh, this was the first light depth greenhouse that we ever did. We actually did this with a company called Agritech. Um, Agritech worked with us many years ago when no other greenhouse companies would and that's something that we've really come a long way with as far as you know it took legalization for greenhouse companies to even recognize us I guess you could say and so you know many years ago there was only a select few greenhouse companies that would even mess with the suppliers of cannabis companies and we couldn't really get the things that we needed or learn some of the things that we wanted to learn because there was just so much differences between you know cannabis and non-cannabis related businesses and things and so um, once we did get this um, light depth system installed and done um, it kind of became uh, the fuse for all the other greenhouse companies to copy and to use and to ba basically um, um, mimic I guess you could say we were the first company to use a triple layer breathable blackout material most companies were using single layer for whatever other crops they use um, for light deprivation. Other crops might be poinsettias, most commonly people know of. Um, also, the forestry uh, service uses them to put uh, pine trees into dormancy to make seed. So there's a lot of different reasons, but they all use one layer. Now we're finding that two layers is okay because we're using light meters to quantify how much light there is. We're not going, oh, bro, I see a light leak. <laughs> oh, no, you know, like we're actually able to use things and go, okay, yeah. There's no light here, it's safe. Um, and so by doing that, we've actually saved a couple bucks. And so from the suppliers, what they told me is that most of Canada is 100% double layer and America is 50-50 on the double to triple layer. Uh, but again, it does save a couple bucks. Um, here's what it looks like with an exterior deprivation system on the outside of the greenhouse. It's closing a little bit, but you can see that it does cast quite a bit of a shadow. And so interior systems are really, um, uh, better to work with in the long run, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, the cost is what really drove people to go into some of the um, exterior ones. Uh, but again, once it falls apart or becomes non-code when compliance comes in, uh, there's no savings there either. And so this is considered a rack and pinion system. It's pretty standard in all the greenhouses with all the companies. And it's not that we even invented the rack and pinion system. The greenhouse companies already utilized these and we just added our, you know, specific uh, curtains and special flashings and corners and seals and things that they didn't originally have before. Um, and so this is what uh, some cannabis growing inside of a Gothic looks like in California. This is actually the second and third place winner of the Emerald Cup right here. Um, it's, I, I forget the name of the farm. He goes by Grandpa. Everybody calls him Grandpa. And his strain is called This Is The Shit. <laughs> It's got an abbreviation, but I don't really use the abbreviation because it's, it gets, it's offensive sometimes to people. Um, nevertheless, um, there's a lot of fans in there. Um, it's, it's, it's a great greenhouse uh, for Grandpa, for sure. And then we get into the A-frame greenhouses. There's quite a few different A-frames, but nevertheless, most greenhouse manufacturers use 
um, have a hoop house, have a gothic, and have an A-frame uh, choice. And so um, here's inside with the rolling benches. Uh, those ones were next gen. This one's another Agritech greenhouse. This one's actually, I like this one a lot. It's impressive to me because it's not using exhaust fans and intakes. It's a passively ventilated A-frame. Um, and a lot of people kind of are on the fence between mechanical ventilation, passive ventilation, which is better, negative pressure, positive pressure. We can go over all that stuff later, but using a passively ventilated large scale greenhouse like this, I think is pretty cool with the ridge vents, sides roll up, the ends roll up, and it's only using circulation fans on the inside. And so um, I really dig that greenhouse a lot. Uh, this greenhouse is a, a grow tech. It doesn't have any fans yet, it's still under construction, uh, but these A-frames are configured in so many different ways that um, it really makes it kind of user-friendly in the sense that you can you know, pretty much get what you want into one mega facility. Here's another greenhouse. The difference with this one compared to the others, even though it's an A-frame, is it's positive pressure. You wouldn't be able to see that from the outside, but the noteworthy part of this picture is the airlock right there. You drive into that chamber with a piece of equipment or a forklift, and it actually um, is an airlock before you enter the rest of the greenhouse, and so it's really great for contamination purposes and things like that. Other industries have bigger problems than we do, and so they go to great measures, uh, even though we can go to those. It's maybe, I don't know, we can talk about whether it's necessary all the time or not, but nevertheless, um, there are all kinds of, uh, like I said, extraordinary measures you can go to to try, to try to prevent bugs and pathogens and other things like that. Here's what it looks like inside that same greenhouse with those big ducting and tubes going across the top. So um, for those of you that aren't familiar with negative and positive pressure, negative pressure is with the exhaust fans at one end, intakes at the other, the air gets pulled through the greenhouse and out the other side, that's negative pressure. This is positive pressure, so they're turning the fans around and blowing the air in, and so it can be fresh air or it can recycle the air. Um, one thing to know about positive pressure greenhouses is that not all companies do them the same. Do them the same. Um, and so it's always good to work with a reputable company that really knows what they're doing. Um, when you're doing positive pressure anyway. Um, here's a negative pressure greenhouse, but it's also got a corridor down the center, um, a little different than the one that I showed at the beginning of the A-frames, but again, there's a lot of ways to do these greenhouses with these corridors, head houses, um, and so on. Uh, here's another A-frame, a little more outfitted. Just getting into flowering. It's go time. <laughs> um, this is another A-frame. Actually, it's a gothic, but it looks like an A-frame because it's on the inside it's just huge and vast. Uh, but there's a lot of existing greenhouses in the Salinas Valley. So unlike Pueblo, Colorado, where it's all new construction, California had a lot of existing greenhouses. And so all those existing greenhouses needed a tremendous amount of work. And so between Santa Barbara County and Salinas Valley and Monterey County, um, there's just a lot of berry hoops, existing A-frames, Gothic frames, big gutter connected structures and things like that. And so they were for other industries like cut flowers um, and vegetable starts and things like that. And so they do come with, you know, this degree of retrofit that is needed and a lot of people don't know what the metric is for where do we begin they know where to begin but they don't know where to stop a lot of times we don't know necessarily what it takes or people have this other idea that if we go this far we'll grow the best cannabis and a lot of times we go so far that we spend so much money that it's really hard to crawl out of these holes and so i always look at the retrofits as a you know, a, a great way to get into something, but at the same time, if you're not practical and have good planning of what you need to retrofit at what specific time in order to get some crops going and get a return, it can actually be a huge money drain, even though it looked like a great, you know, investment at the beginning. Um, setting up new greenhouses can be pretty expensive, but also, like I said, these retrofits can go pretty haywire too. I've seen people where they move in lose their ass, another person moves in, they lose their ass, and the third person moves in, and it's like, oh, we're kind of set. And a lot of these greenhouses are leased, too, so the landowner um, is really the one that's coming out uh, ahead. Um, here's some glass structures. A lot of people think that the glass structures might be the leapfrog to greatness, but it's not necessarily true in my opinion. Um, there's a lot of debate out there between glass and polycarbonates with the clear and the diffused. 
Um, I really have been around cannabis my whole life, like I was saying earlier, since I was 18. And, um, you know, I just see a lot more than THC and just CBD. And so, you know, the cannabinoids, the, the amount of cannabinoids there are, as well as terpenes are really important to make a full spectrum or, a, a, you know, a complete medicine in my opinion. And so a lot of times, we can get down the road of chasing THC or even chasing CBD. And the new thing is CBG, it seems like. And so a lot of people will say, we only get these characteristics if we grow certain ways. And I don't think we're ready to lump everybody into that, that category yet. There's just not enough research out there. The research that I've been doing with labs has been showing a lot of times that overexposure causes plants to overheat, sweat, and actually lose some of that production. Whereas a supported plant actually living to its fullest potential can give us more benefits. And so, like I said, a lot of people will like the controlled environment. I'm looking for a more supportive environment. The controlled word really gets kind of, well, you know, used a little bit crazy in this idea that we're gonna control things to the degree of, you know, the planet makes no choices on its own anymore. But a lot of times, uh, the plant is what dictates um, everything and, and it's not necessarily us. Um, one of the tests that I did with a lab was doing some OG Kush that typically is a high THC and we did it outside and so it was of course high THC but under the greenhouse covers that we were experimenting with, especially the diffuse, we had 7% CBD in an OG Kush. So it was pretty ironic to see you know, the full sun not develop some of the same characteristics that the more supported uh, plant was in the greenhouse. You know, the yields are a little different too. That can go back and forth. But again, um, you know, glass a lot of times was really great for some of the Dutch cut flower and things like that. Uh, but their plants act a lot different than cannabis. A lot of times they'll say a plant is a plant. You know, a plant is a plant. You know, they keep saying those kind of things, but it's not necessarily true. A lot of the other plants don't have all these terpenes and cannabinoids that we're trying to procure in the first place and maybe extract and save for later. You know, if you can take cannabis and dry it out too much and lose the smell, you can't bring it back a lot of times. Once it turns to hay, it's hay. So we can do that in the growing process too. It doesn't take just the drying process to screw things up. And so it's kind of a hand in hand process. And so over the course of time, you know, we learned also that you know, this was a big deal in California and actually a lot of places. I see there, I read the headlines and see the recalls in different states and places like that. And so cannabis doesn't let you slide. Because it's a dynamic and bioaccumulator, it's going to clean up the soil and the air around it and any of the little sneaky things that people try to pull in to maybe save the day. And, you know, because cannabis is heavily tested and regulated, we can see all these things. Hemp, not so much. You know, people are starting to do their due diligence on the smokable flower for hemp to see if they have heavy metals and certain contaminants. But, I mean, I don't see a lot of tests out there on the smokable flower. Um, and it makes me nervous just because, like I said, we had a tough time in California keeping it clean. And it isn't just the farming practices. The drift is real. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, when you go to some of these valleys in Salinas and Monterey County, surrounded by strawberries, grapes, you know, lettuces and things that are being sprayed, it's not uncommon to pop for some of these, um, some of these things. Um, up north, a lot of people were popping for lead, elephant, you know, it's like the elephant in the room, where do the heavy metals come from? Um, you know, it's tough. I mean, a lot of minerals and micronutrients can have heavy metals in them. Um, the, you know, chicken, chicken uh, bedding has arsenic in it, and so organic chicken manure compost. Uh, garden hoses that have you know, made from different countries. If they're not real rubber hoses, they actually have little warning signs that say don't drink out of the hose. And so that is the stuff that, you know, really contributes a lot to this um, contamination level that we're running into. Um, the plant material passes a lot. I see plant material pass all the time. Take that to concentration and that's where we find all the goodies. Luckily for most people, remediation does exist, but you know, now we're relying on our extractors to make sure that they do the right job and get us the return that we need and don't go, wow, we lost a lot on that one. You're know, like, really? <laughs> um, hostile environments, really, this is what creates, you know, the slide before. Having these problems gets us to maybe either A, learn how to farm better, or B, pull out the, you know, pull out the, the tricks to try to, you know, to pull, stop this stuff. Uh, pests are really, you know, a big problem. Uh, Cross-contamination is easy to do in a lot of these big facilities. I see a lot of people walking by with trays of clones right past the harvesting, you know, trays or, or carts going by with harvested material and things like that. 
Mold is a big one everywhere. A lot of times mold can be, um, you know, just in some of these other states that we're dealing with. I know people in Oklahoma were super fear fearful of mold on their outdoor crops. Um, we dealt with that. Powdery mildew is usually, you know, a, a big one for a lot of people. And, and a lot of times it can be corrected even in the growing medium. Most people, I spent 10 years chasing environments around and I forgot, oh, down below there's an environment too. If you don't get that one right, you're not gonna correct any of this stuff. It's kind of hand in hand. Um, and so that's why greenhouse planning is super important. Um, I've been dealing with that for a long time, just in the idea that it's cannabis and we're using them in the summertime and not all these places work um, well for some of the systems that are, that are, that are allowed or available, not allowed, available. Uh, when you get into uh, the ventilation systems, a lot of people look at for cooling, but a lot of times I'm just trying to avoid the solar gain. Um, you know, you can use these wet wall cooling systems, but again, they don't work everywhere. They work great in Pueblo. They work great where it's really hot and dry. So there's places in Southern California they work really good. I was at a greenhouse one time in Death Valley of all places and it was 114 degrees outside, but they had the greenhouse at 85 degrees inside, really great. Um, they struggled when it rained outside and the monsoon seasons came. And so that's why I always like, you know, think about it or say, you know, the greenhouses are only as controllable as the weather outside sometimes. You know, the variables and changes in the weather are going to change the greenhouse environment and how it actually operates and how it works. It's really, you know, hard to hear people say, I'm going to get a hybrid greenhouse and really, it's almost like an indoor grow room with some free sun. Um, that also can be kind of expensive. I've had to tell people they're better off just growing indoors and uh, rather than trying the hybrid greenhouse thing. Um, transpiration is the number one reason that we have condensation in greenhouses. And so a lot of times when people talk to me about humidity in their greenhouses, they want me to go up to them and say, oh, just plug this in. You know, that'll take care of all your problems. You know, I can ship it to you tomorrow. And really what it is is backing up and getting people to understand their plants a little bit better. Um, you know, sometimes we have not a complete understanding of farming and what we're doing when we're getting into these greenhouses into the summertime, creating these hostile environments, and then we have plants that are just like us. They sweat. Whereas ours is called perspiration, right? Plants are called transpiration. And so when a plant sweats, um, it gives off moisture just like we do. Even though it doesn't drip down its forehead, it sticks to the roof of the greenhouse and wants to drip back down. And so a lot of times condensation is a result of plant sweat first and foremost. And how do we deal with that? Well, a lot of people would say default to a cooling system. But again, I've been saying this whole time, the cooling systems don't always work. And so one of the ways to deal with it, A, is avoid solar gain. We don't need the greenhouse effect. And B, is using diffusion, whether it's in a climate screen, also known as a shade cloth, or through the greenhouse covers. The greenhouse covers can actually do amazing things. You know, diffusion, you know, also the greenhouse manufacturers, not the manufacturers themselves, the people that make these covers, the glass and the diffuse people will kind of go head to head. The glass people will say, you know, 1% light is 1% growth. The diffusions people say, well, I'm split light, splitting light particles in half and we're gathering more particles even on a cloudy day than I would if I was directly outside. And so um, I find that to be true a lot of times because through the testing that we've done on the cannabis from inside and outside, we can see some of these delicate properties or, you know, these terpenes and these cannabinoids show up when they normally would get zapped or burned away. Um, the sun can be really intense. Um, a lot of times the colors that we use in the greenhouse also can affect how the greenhouse is growing. And so this part of the video isn't as important, but when you get over here, it's one of my favorite tools in the greenhouse too, it'll tell you a lot. 103 degrees, I move it over three inches and it's down to 86 degrees. That was just the colors that I use in the greenhouse. It's really why we, you see a lot of tan grow bags and white ground cover. People were historically using black ground cover because that's what the stores sold. Black plastic pots, because that's what they had. Even the smart pots were all black for a long time. Eventually we started seeing these lighter colors and these other options come around because uh, I really started pushing them um, and using this thing all the time, telling me all these things. And so when you see you know, your root system in a black container up to 130 degrees, even if the air temperature isn't that high, we already are running into a problem. Water conservation in California was super huge, and so that was another reason that we were trying to understand some of these things in the water usage. So you can see full sun under the diffused, no ground cover. So it does drop the temperatures, you know. It, it actually made the temperatures drop even more by using the white ground cover. 
the brown dirt still absorbs or stores some energy and heat compared to the to the white ground cover. And so am I supposed to do a Q&A towards the end or is this the end? No, no, we, we, if, if you end here in a couple minutes, we'll have 10 minutes for Q&A. We have 10 minutes for Q&A, okay, I love it, all right. Um, and um, you can see more of this stuff on my Instagram. Um, let's see, oh, it's on this slide right here because we're gonna do a Q&A. And so if you go to my Instagram account, Light Depth Greenhouse, um, you'll see a lot more videos that I've posted over the course of time on some of these concepts. Uh, because I have people in Oklahoma that were really fearful of heat and humidity. Um, I also have people in other states that just want to do proof of concept. And so one of the things that I tell people, especially in the greenhouse class that I teach at Oaksterdam University, is proof of concept can be pretty simple as far as getting a hoop house, standing on a ladder, and pulling tarps for two months. You can really learn a lot about the plant, the business, how things are really going to go, the genetics that you're going to run in a small two-month window and pulling tarps yourself. I mean, you can't beat it, and in some cases, depending on the hoop house you get, you can get it for a couple thousand bucks, um, and it's really cheap. I see people going really big and really expensive just on the idea of things, and they haven't really ironed out a lot of the details. So in order to stay in business and get the most bang for your buck, I always recommend trying something out. I mean, a lot of times, depending, even in California, we can legally do six plants. You can get a 16 by 12 foot hoop, pull a tarp two months. If you blow it, you still learn a lot. Q&A? Yeah, let's do yeah, it. Okay, okay. All right, if you got a question, raise your hand. Excellent. So, I'm seeing big money and interest, you know, bring together state-of-the-art data room technology and HVAC and, you know, create these uber hybrid greenhouses in places like Michigan. Now I'm still not sold, you know, like you have the heat load that you're going to be carrying through the winter there, not to mention the engineering is going to go into that facility for snow load, and then you have this sealed grow environment in a place where, you know, and they're claiming to me like, well, still on these cloudy days and in, you know, northern Michigan, you're still getting three or four hundred micromoles on a cloudy day, and then you have your supplement of life. But I'm still not sold. I'm just wondering if you've done the engineering, you know anybody that has in those northern latitudes where they just don't have a lot of sunshine, but yet people are still trying to sell these uber hybrid greenhouse concepts. Well, I mean, you know, again, greenhouses were invented for wintertime, so they'll do good throughout the winter. It's the summertime where I see them have the most problems, and so most people, like I said, with their year-round greenhouse are trying to grow in the summer, and then, yes, getting these fancy, expensive, using other people's money to, you know, get these things going, big investments, you know, a lot, of, a lot of finance going on for big facilities and big dreams. But again, a lot of people have some variables and learning curves to go through, and that's why, you know, yeah, it, it, it's, it needs to be a little bit pump the brakes and do this in sections, a little bit smaller phases. I always look for phase one and phase two upgrades if possible, you know, all those things. But a lot of people have big money, want to go in and make a splash, make a name, we're setting the bar. You know, they're like, we're setting the bar, we're going to be the ones. You know, you always hear that, we're going to be the, we're the first, you know, and the, that kind of stuff. And so a lot of people are cool with spending a bunch of money, getting a bunch of things they don't know how to run, create a bunch of, you know, data that's only maybe to them and not share it because a lot of it's, you know, not so great to share the first year or so. And so, unfortunately, I get hired to go around and deal with a lot of these experiments and try to sort out, you know, what to do about making them work efficiently. And, and you know, I mean, some of them will work fine, but it's going to take, and I've seen this in a couple other facilities, it's a five-year learning curve. Um, I actually have two questions for you. Um, we have a greenhouse here in Colorado, and the glazing that we went with originally was the SolarSoft 85-100 uh, diffusion. Uh, we were pretty shocked to see the reduction in transmission that was coming through that glazing. Um, so we're looking at potentially reglazing it, and when we need to reglaze with a, a different SolarSoft, the SolarSoft 90-40% transmission, what would be, the first question is, what would be your ideal uh, ratio of transmission versus diffusion. The second question is, have you ever experimented with any uh, earth-to-air heat exchange systems for greenhouses? Um, yeah, um, the first part of the question, and if I forget the second part, just remind me, I got short-term memory loss. Um, 
The first part of the question is, is I always use SolarSoft 85, but you know, I work with a lot of greenhouse companies too, and there's a lot of different info out there and what's coming back from these farms and whether they should switch, go to clear, single or double. You know, I was in a discussion with um, a greenhouse manufacturer right outside here about this particular topic. And like I was saying, I always benefited from SolarSoft 85 single wall. Um, corrugated, but in the winter time it can get kind of drippy. So you know it kind of gets tough because on a on a double wall diffuse, typically the manufacturers will say it transmits 74 to 79 percent light, and on a single wall they'll say it transmits eight, up to 85 percent light. And so while the transmission is important, I think the diffusion is just as important too. And so it's really you know tough to get our cake and eat it too. But they are coming out with more things. Um, over the course of time. Being in Colorado, you're closer to the sun too, so I always see, you know, closer, higher up the intensity. I'm not always worried about the shading as much, but one of the things that needs to happen is that our metric back in the day, and still to this day, is that we need to get 50 pounds per thousand square feet. You know, that was our minimum average harvest, 50 pounds in a thousand square feet. If we weren't hitting that, we had a problem, and we hit that plenty of times with diffused. You know, so it wasn't a matter of yields or whatever that we weren't getting from some of these greenhouse covers. A lot of times it had to do with the control, you know, that word control, but the support of the greenhouse. In the summertime, we'd get a lot of condensation because the plants overheat. We got to deploy shade cloth. Deploying shade cloth restricts light. You know, turning on the cooling systems also helps, but sometimes it was a combo of both. Shade, cooling. You know, so now we're diffused, but we're restricting light rather than diffuse splitting light and creating more light. You know, that's what they say is that diffusion can restrict and diffusion can, you know, split light particles and create, make more. So that's why I always say that diffusion is almost like magic because it's creating more light. But again, you know, there are people starting to split the hairs a little bit like you're saying. And so, you know, I don't know to say you should do this, but, you know, that's kind of what I'm, you know, knowing right now. And then as far as the cooling or heating systems, the natural ones like the GOT, or the you know geothermal type stuff. It can be done, but I see that as like a dream part of the project. And so you want to make sure that that's affordable and that somebody's done it before and it's really going to work because I see a lot of people that want to do the follow the dreams on the first go. And it can be kind of expensive because we kind of need to get the business up and running with what works and what's affordable. And so sometimes, you know, if it's affordable and you got a good person that knows how to do it, then by all means do it. But I come from the background of a lot of people that come up and go, yeah, I know how to do that. And for some reason they get hired and they don't really know how to do these things, you know, and it costs more money, time to get this stuff working and then maybe it does or doesn't work. And so time and money is really important in cannabis to get up and running right now and get a return on investment. And so that's why I always kind of go with simple and what works, get some return going and then start following the dreams a little bit, if that makes sense. Until we got time for one more. Um, so, uh, just following up on what he was asking as far as like the SolarSoft 85, um, we were just kind of shocked because we were doing some spot measurements that were finding basically by the time things hit the canopy about 75% uh, reduction in PAR and right up next to the glazing material more like a 50%. And so we're going to get it analyzed because there's some confusion over whether or not it was actually that material. And I was just curious if you've done measurements, uh, you know, on like big like very sunny day with that material, what kind of reduction in intensity you're seeing? Because obviously there's going to be some that's coming through the material and then the diffusion may change things a little bit too, but just follow up. Sometimes the power meters kind of fool me or the power meters aren't my favorite way of, of, of uh, metering light. A lot of times for me, I use a Lux meter um, and try to find out, you know, not necessarily the sun's intensity through power, but the amount of light that's available. And so play around with a Lux meter. You can even get an app on your iPhone to kind of see how bright things are from inside to outside. I was at a greenhouse facility that was kind of in a cloudy day the other day, and they really rely on their Gavita lights. Like they're just all about the lights in the winter, keep the blackout closed, kind of run it like an indoor. I pulled out my Lux meter and we had like, you know, it was like 1200 Lux under the Gavitas. And then when he opened the curtain and turned off the lights, we were over 13,000 at that point. So I mean, in a lot of ways he was doing self a disservice by relying on the lights and not getting some of the free sun because of the sun's intensity. But again, I wasn't using a PAR meter to kind of quantify its intensity. But again, I'm not a huge PAR person. Um, even though I know it's important to some people, I just, from my background, I've seen a lot of big cannabis grows and a lot of wheat come out of these greenhouses. And 
a lot of them have been the diffuse, but now we're kind of in this new era where people are, you know, maybe producing less, and I don't always equate it to the greenhouse skins. Right on, cool. Let's uh, let's hear it for Eric Branstad. Thank you, Eric.